Hello, my name is Kim Haynes and I'm a Principal Product Marketing Manager in the Chemistry Technology Center at Waters Corporation. The title of today's talk is Don't Get Stuck with Low Sensitivity, Recovery, and High Variability. But what we're really going to talk about is a systematic approach for improving the recovery of hydrophobic peptides during LCMS analysis. So we'll have a really good discussion about what causes hydrophobic peptide losses and some different steps and considerations that you can think about to avoid those losses. The agenda for today's talk will be a discussion about nonspecific binding and why we should care about it. The second topic will be a discussion of factors that influence nonspecific binding and how we can use this knowledge to our advantage. And finally, we'll wrap this up into some case studies showing how nonspecific binding and the ability to control that can influence your analysis. When we think about nonspecific binding or nonspecific absorption, for the purposes of this talk, we're really focusing in on any binding or, no, or absorption that was not intended. Um, now molecules can adhere or you know, stick to any exposed surface. So really what we're talking about is that any chemical reaction can be a source of nonspecific binding, but most dominantly we're thinking about things that are polarity-based interactions, such as hydrophobic attraction or ionic interactions, for example, columbic interaction or inter attraction. If we look at the diagram on the right-hand side, mm -hmm. um, you can see kind of an example of ligand binding, for example. Uh, we see the ligand and we have specific mm -hmm. binding there in green, where the analyte is specifically attaching to that ligand. Those two are designed to attract one another. We have nonspecific binding losses where we have the analytes that are sticking to the surface as well as to um, the ligand bind um, attraction and so on. So um, these are some examples of what we mean by nonspecific binding or specific binding. Now to suppress nonspecific binding of known analytes, it's important to think about what you're trying to achieve. And the key goal here is to avoid the interaction between the surface and the analyte itself. And at the same time, maintain the environment so that the interactions are not strong. And we'll go into more detail on that in the, in the next slide. So how does nonspecific binding affect our analysis? Here we're looking at a chromatogram of laprolide, which has a molecular weight of about 1200. And we see in this circumstance, we have very little nonspecific binding. And our percent CV is 1.7% with an N of three. So we have very little nonspecific binding losses and our reproducibility is quite good. But if we were to take that same sample and not control for nonspecific binding losses, we can see that at the inset of those really tall peaks, if we look low at the bottom of that chromatogram, we see if we blow that up uh, 50 fold, now we have actually a very high CV. So we have very low repeatability. We have a lot of nonspecific binding that's going on. Our percent CV is 42%. Um, so we have very high nonspecific binding losses there. And essentially, the result of that is low sensitivity, high variability, and ultimately unreliable analytical results. One thing that you can do to avoid nonspecific binding is actually have a very thoughtful, informed choice of the sample container that you choose. So you're gonna choose a material based on the dominant chemical reactions or interactions that you want to avoid. So for example, if you think about your analyte, you think about is it nonpolar or polar? Um, is it uncharged or charged? Or is it basic or is it acidic? So for example, if you have a nonpolar analyte, essentially you want to avoid putting in a container that also has a hydrophobic surface. If you have a polar analyte, you need to think about if it's an uncharged polar or you know, more neutral, or if it's charged. If it's uncharged, you want to choose a container to avoid hydrogen bond formation. If it's a charged polar, you need to think about is it acidic or basic? If it's basic, you want to avoid glass, which has silanol interactions. If it's acidic, you may need to avoid metal, which be, would be a chelation interaction. 
but can we use this approach for protein and peptide samples? Yes, we can, but it's a little bit complex. Nonspecific binding of proteins and peptides can be quite complicated. Um, it's a lot more difficult to deal with nonspecific binding of these types of molecules compared to small molecules. So for example, if we look at nortriptylin, which is relatively small with a molecular weight of 263, you know, it may only have one to two interactions due to its size. As we look in the middle at glucagon with a molecular weight of 3,500, with this larger size, it may have several types of interactions. And when we get to really large things like serum albumin with a molecular weight of 66,000, now we can have lots of interactions. And surface absorption may occur through various mechanisms. You may also have permanent deformation during the absorption process to a surface um, and have also additionally cooperative effects. So how can we predict if a molecule will undergo nonspecific binding problems? One indicator is the isoelectric point, of, which is essentially the overall surface charge of the biomolecule. It's not the same as a pKa or a pKb. What we're looking at is the average charge here across the molecule, and that may also affect the solubility. HPLC index is a very good indicator for nonspecific binding challenges, and that's an overall indicator of hydrophobicity. Hydrophobic proteins or peptides with an HPLC index of greater than 30 may absolutely have hydrophobic nonspecific binding or protein binding. They're more prone to carryover um, and lower reversed phase solid phase extraction um, recovery um, if you're trying to clean them up that way. Hydrophilic proteins or peptides are more likely soluble in aqueous solutions. These have an HPLC index of less than 30. Um, usually they don't have issues with nonspecific binding or protein binding, um, but they may have ionic nonspecific binding, and you may have difficulty retaining them if you're trying to clean them up by a solid phase extraction. Molecular weight can also be an indicator of nonspecific binding issues. Larger molecules tend to have more diverse interaction groups, uh, like we saw on that previous slide, and larger ones tend to be more hydrophobic and, and sticky. Um, so it's definitely good to collect as much information as you can, but even then it's still a challenge to apply all that information and understand if you're going to have challenges with nonspecific binding. A common technique that's employed to avoid nonspecific binding is to add things to your actual sample. So that could be things like detergents such as tween 20 or Triton X. Um, it may be large polymeric po molecules like PEG. Most commonly for bioanalysis, we see things like carrier proteins like bovine serum albumin, casein, or rat plasma. But those additives actually come with their own sets of problems. If you look at the chromatograms across the bottom of the screen, you'll see that uh, with no blocking agent, we have the chromatogram in red. But as we start to add things to our sample, like BSA or 0.1% rat plasma or PEG, we're actually adding things into our sample that may cause things like increased sample complexity, um, more possible causes of matrix effects, and just overall contamination of columns and instrumentation. Um, so while these things do help prevent nonspecific binding, they also introduce a different set of challenges. In addition to that, um, the addition of these additives can also lead to froth formation during pipetting, which can lead to measurement errors as well. The challenge that we faced within our own laboratories was within our peptide bioanalysis workflows. So we would have our sample in a biological matrix like plasma, and we would perform a sample preparation cleanup step. And we did that to improve our sensitivity, specificity of, of our peptide, um, to resolve it from endogenous matrix components, to increase our recovery and reduce matrix effects. Now, once we had cleaned up and concentrated that sample, we had a choice, you know, did we want to add back in blocking agents to our clean sample? Um, or what, could we risk loss of the analyte before LCMS analysis? So ultimately, the question that we faced was, where do we put our clean concentrated sample before we inject it into the system? 
to create a solution to that problem, it actually led us to create uh, one of our newer product lines, which is the Quan Recovery Vials and Plates with Max Peak High Performance Surfaces. Um, these are clean polypropylene surface containers designed specifically for LCMS applications. Um, and they actually have a hydrophilic surface modification. Um, it's not a coating or a foreign chemical that we've deposited onto the surface, but again, it's an actual surface modification that reduces the hydrophobicity of the polypropylene and allows it to perform much better and have better recovery for hydrophobic uh, peptides and proteins. These come in two different formats. There's a 300 microliter injection vial, as well as a 700 microliter 96 well plate. So now I'd like to move on to the second part of our seminar and talk about some of the factors that influence nonspecific binding and how we can use this knowledge to our advantage. All of the work that you're about to see was done using an Acuity UPLC I-Class system with a fixed loop injector. We used a Cortex C18 Plus column in a 2.1 by 50 millimeter um, column format with a 1.6 micron particle. And we used formic acid acetonitrile gradient conditions. The mass spec, mass spec detector was a Zevo TQS with a universal source. We wanted to do our testing with a wide variety of peptides to cover uh, a chemical diversity of properties. So we chose some representative peptides. Um, you'll see at the bottom on the chart here, desmopressin, teriparatide, glucagon, insulin, and melatonin. We also did look at enfervitide, but we found that under acidic conditions, enfervitide really didn't give us useful information. So you'll see most of our data here focusing in on those top five peptides. So we have a range again of molecular weights from 1,000 up to 6,000. We cover a wide range of isoelectric points from four to 12, and our HPLC index spans from eight to 116, representing differences in size, charge states, and hydrophobicity. We used peptide recovery as the main qualifier to evaluate nonspecific binding losses. So that means that the greater recovery values, those samples did not experience the nonspecific binding losses. So the peptide samples were prepared in two parallel groups. The test group was in neat water acetonitrile solutions. The reference group was in the same solution as test, but with the added um, benefit of having the 0.1% rat plasma to act as a carrier protein and protect against nonspecific binding losses. Recovery was calculated using the um, equation you see below, where we divided the peak area from the test group, divided by the average peak area from the reference group. When we look at that data, we can make some pretty interesting observations. So you'll see four of our peptides at the top, desmopressin, glucagon, glucagon insulin, and melatonin on the right-hand side of the screen, with melatonin being the most hydrophobic and desmopressin being the least hydrophobic. We evaluated those peptides in a variety of different containers. So if you look at the top, you'll see the LCMS certified glass vials, followed by TrueView glass vials, silenized glass vials, which are deactivated glass, polypropylene vials, polypropylene plates, a commercially available low binding plate, a quan recovery vial, and a quan recovery plate. And all of these peptides were stored um, under LCMS storage conditions. What you'll notice is that desmopressin is actually a very well behaving peptide. No matter what the sample container was, we got very, very good recovery of the desmopressin back out of that sample container. But as we move to the more hydrophobic peptides, meaning glucagon, insulin, and melatonin, we see that we lose those peptides very dramatically to nonspecific binding losses. And all of the sample containers, with the exception of the bottom three, um, the commercially available low binding plate, the quan recovery vial, and the quan recovery plate. Uh, but even the most challenging peptide, melatonin, we get the best recovery out of the quan recovery vial and especially the quan recovery plate. So the recovery of these hydrophobic peptides then can be a really good indicator 
of which kinds of containers do a good job at mitigating nonspecific binding losses. So here's another really interesting observation about how sample matrix can affect recovery. Here we're looking at teriparatide, and we're looking at the percent recovery of teriparatide in three different containers. The green line is the Quan recovery plate, the red is a conventional polypropylene plate, and the blue is a commercially available low binding plate. And as you look across the graph for the recovery of teriparatide on the x-axis, we're looking at the percentage of acetonitrile in the sample solvent. On the y-axis, we're looking at recovery. And what you'll notice is, is that the Quan recovery uh, plate actually provided the highest recovery in the lowest percentage of acetonitrile. But is that a significant benefit? If we look further at the data, we see that if we moved to higher percentages of acetonitrile, for example, 25 to 30%, we're able to get good recovery of the teriparatide no matter what the sample container is. But if you look at the chromatographic results of that, you'll see that at 25, 30, and 40% acetonitrile, we actually get breakthrough of our teriparatide in our chromatographic evaluation. If we reduce the amount of acetonitrile in that starting condition, we're actually able to fully retain our teriparatide on the column itself. So you see 0%, 10%, and 20%. We actually don't have breakthrough of the teriparatide in our chromatographic analysis. So by the having the ability to work in a lower percentage of acetonitrile and get high recovery actually aids in our ability to reduce those nonspecific binding losses and get better chromatography from our LC analysis. We also thought it was important to look at the stability of sample containers under acidic or basic conditions, which are very common in LCMS analysis of these types of analytes. So here we looked at a Quan recovery plate, a Quan recovery vial, um, and then in blue, the commercially available low binding plate, and in red, a polypropylene plate. And we filled these sample containers with either one molar acid or one molar base and capped them. We stored them then for 24 hours, and then we thoroughly rinsed all of the containers with DI water until the pH of the rinse water had returned to normal. Then we ran a test with glucagon and evaluated recovery. And what we noticed when we did this was the performance for the Quan recovery vials and plates actually stayed very stable, as actually did the polypropylene plate, um, even though we really had low recovery um, period out of that container. What we did notice as well was that after that 24 hours exposure to acid, we did see some decline in performance of that commercially available low bind plate. But it's again, it's important to know if your sample container of choice is actually stable under those high acidic or basic conditions that you may need to use for LCMS analysis. Here's another important example to think about, and it's actually the exposure of your sample and the sample container to different temperatures during analysis. Here we're looking at the Quan recovery plate in green, and we're looking at the commercially available low binding plate in blue. We're looking at storage temperature across the x-axis from 4 degrees up to RT, which is room temperature, and we're looking at recovery of melatonin and glucagon. Um, and the melatons in the solid bars and glucagon in those hashed bars. So what we notice is that for both of those peptides, um, we get good recovery of those peptides in the Quan recovery plate. But if we look at the increasing temperatures for that commercially available low binding plate, you'll see that as the temperature becomes warmer, um, specifically 15 degrees C or room temperature, we have dramatic losses of both the melatonin and the glucagon at those warmer temperatures. So I like to think about, you know, are we working on the lab bench uh, with our peptides in these containers? Um, you can see that under those types of conditions where it's warmer, we get dramatically 
less of our peptide back out of that container due to nonspecific binding losses than we do with that Quan recovery plate. Um, and this one was really surprising to me, actually, when we saw this work come out of the lab, because it really made me think about that time you spend on the lab bench doing solid phase extraction or doing um, other types of sample preparation with our sample um, before it goes to sit in that LC auto sampler. Another surprising finding was that I think, in general, most scientists are aware that nonspecific binding losses can be a problem at lower concentrations. Uh, but our work also found that they can be a challenge at higher concentrations. In this case, we're looking at insulin, and we're looking at it at 1 nanogram per mil and 100 nanograms per mil. And in the red peaks here, we're looking at storage in a standard polypropylene plate. But as we move that to a Quan recovery plate, we can see that at one nanogram per mil, just by choosing the right sample container, we're able to increase our peak area 25 fold in the Quan recovery plate at one nanogram per mil. At 100 nanogram per mil, even just by choosing the Quan recovery plate here, we're able to increase our peak area twofold. So while the nonspecific binding losses are more dramatic and apparent at low concentrations, there's still a problem at higher concentrations, and this can definitely cause variability in your analytical results. Another impact of nonspecific binding is on your calibration curves. Um, so if you're doing bioanalysis, this is definitely something that you'll take note of. Uh, so here we're looking at calibration curves generated with the Waters Quan recovery plate in green. Um, in red is a conventional polypropylene plate, in blue is a commercially available low binding plate, and in the kind of X um, cross mark line is a sample containing a carrier protein to prevent nonspecific binding. And this is melatonin again, our most challenging peptide, um, and it's a calibration curve from 0 0.05 up to 100 nanograms per mil. And what you'll notice right away at the bottom is in the standard polypropylene plate, we don't get a calibration curve at all because uh, we have lost all of it to nonspecific binding. But as we move up that graph, you'll see the commercially available low binding plate in blue um, wasn't able to produce a linear curve, and that's due to losses due to nonspecific binding at the lower concentrations. Um, at, uh, at the Quan recovery plate, and then also using the carrier protein, we were able to get linear curves, calibration curves for both of those. But remember that in the Quan recovery plate, we can actually do that without that additional need for carrier protein. Another consideration of sample loss is actually the design of the sample container itself. And here we're talking about that in terms of residual volume. If you just focus in on the blue traces here, um, you'll see that that is a commercially available low binding plate. And what we're looking at here is just one microliter injections from that particular sample well. So you can imagine if we started with maybe 50 microliters of sample, as we start making those one microliter injections, we get down to about um, 46, 47 microliters of sample, and we start seeing that line in the blue jump up and down. And what that means is that we're not able to get reproducible injections out of that sample well anymore, and that's because we've reached the maximum amount of sample that we're able to draw up out of that well. Now, if we look at the green trace above that, um, you'll see that with the Quan recovery plate, we're able to get down to about the last seven or eight microliters um, in that sample well. So we're getting much more usability out of our final sample volume with the Quan recovery design. And it's really a difference in the design of that well. You can see that the blue um, commercially available low blinding well is kind of that U shape, whereas the Quan recovery actually has that tapered V shape. Um, and the same idea is true for the Quan recovery vial. Again, you can see that we're able to get down to about the last five microliters in that particular sample well. So we actually did a study just to kind of compare um, the results if we pulled from different parts of a 96 well plate and, you, and um, the, the um, vial holder as well. And you can see that when we pulled from the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and center, um, the average 
Residual volume we were able to get down to with the Quan Recovery Plate was about eight microliters. With the Quan Recovery Vial, it was about five microliters. Whereas with the commercially available low binding plate when we did that, it was 53 microliters. Um, so again, you know, keeping in mind, um, if you have limited sample volumes available, you're able to get much better usability out of that sample volume when you use a container that's designed to allow you to use the maximum volume that it's capable of. In this last section of the webinar, I'd like to just go through a few case studies to show you some real-time examples of how this can make an impact in your analysis. Here we're looking at an example in proteomics analysis, and we're looking at a glass vial versus a Quan recovery vial. And specifically, we're looking at peaks over 22 hours after they've been stored in the sample injection vial. This is 50 fentamols of an enolase digest. And you can see the first injection in the Quan recovery vial versus the ninth injection in that Quan recovery vial. Uh, we're seeing pretty much the same analysis. These two chromatograms are offset just to show you comparatively the difference. If we look at the first injection versus the ninth injection in a glass vial, you can see that by the ninth injection, we've lost a lot of this digest due to nonspecific binding. And here's a different way of looking at that data. Um, if we look on the right-hand side, uh, we can look from injection one to injection nine, the Quan recovery vials with that solid circle and the glass vials with that hollow circle. Um, again, you can see that the Quan recovery vials provide very consistent performance, while the glass vials, you experience dramatic loss of that digest over this period of time. Another example is a bioanalysis of a synthetic peptide, and here we're looking at pramlintide. Now this peptide definitely suffers from nonspecific binding. It's fairly large, it has molecular weight close to 4,000, and it's moderately hydrophobic with an HPLC index of 89. You can see in that purple trace at the bottom of the screen on a conventional polypropylene plate, uh, we clearly have a lot of nonspecific binding losses. But if we put that in the Quan recovery plate, we see a 30-fold, 36-fold increase in peak area, and the difference in recovery is, is quite large. We have a peak area of 9,278 in the Quan recovery plate, which is a recovery of 99%. In the conventional polypropylene plate, we only get about 3% recovery. So again, simply choosing a sample container to control for nonspecific binding losses is quite impactful. And here we have an example where we're looking at monoclonal antibody subunit quantification. And in this type of workflow, there are many um, chances or instances to lose um, sample to nonspecific binding. But in all cases here, we can see that just simply by choosing the Quan recovery vial with max peak high performance surfaces versus a standard polypropylene container, uh, we're getting better recoveries across the board. So 94%, 84%, 91%. Um, so again, we're, we're taking steps to avoid those nonspecific binding losses with a thoughtful and informed choice of sample container. So in summary, uh, what I've shown you is that proteins and peptides um, can definitely have problems with sample losses due to nonspecific binding. Um, they may absorb to any surface, especially sample containers, uh, while they're waiting for LCMS injection into the system. And these losses can definitely be detrimental to the assay because they negatively affect recovery, sensitivity, and one of the most important things here is reproducibility. Um, several experimental factors influence the severity of nonspecific binding, and we talked a lot about what those are in this seminar. So it's important to think about that and follow some steps, um, some key advice to prevent losses to the container. Make sure you're choosing an appropriate appropriate container for the sample that you're working with. Um, think about your sample matrix. Remember that example where we showed that the percentage of acetonitrile had an impact in the chromatography um, that you could get from the teriparatide specifically. Um, in higher amounts of acetonitrile, we had breakthrough in our chromatographic run, whereas the ability to work with lower amounts of acetonitrile gave us better chromatography and it was the choice of sample container that allowed us to do that. And it's also important to think about 
the optimal sample storage condition and stability of our sample in the storage condition over time. Just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and thank many people who worked on this project and provided data um, to support this project as well. Um, so you'll see a list of the scientists here. And um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help you anytime. Thank you.